Hello everybody, this is Jade. This week we're covering chapters 7.2 through 7.x in Pact. Um, I'm covering 12 chapters this week instead of 8, so it's gonna seem like I'm skipping over a bunch of stuff. Um, sorry. In 7.2, the Sad Sacks meet up with, um, or are met up with by the Astrologer's champion weapon thing that um that shoots several members of the party and then Isadora shows up and claws the shit out of Blake and um and we find out fairly quickly that Rose already knew that she would replace Blake in the real world if something happened to him and then she finds out that Blake already knew and kept this a secret from him um which just goes to show that both of them knew this secret and kept it a secret from the other. Um, Wild Bill has done a really, really good job of making it so that they are matching each other tit for tat in almost every single violation. Every quality that one of them has, the other has a very slight variation of, if it's a variation at all. Um, we'll get to... I think their most important difference later, but um, for the most part, they are doing the exact same things. We just see inside Blake's head, and we don't see inside Rose's frequently. So I wrote this whole analysis on why the astrologer might have been trying to kill Phil. Is, is she trying to make conquest weaker in the long run? Is she trying to have mercy on Phil because she knows that he wants to die? Is it because she's trying to win? It turns out later that there was really no reason and that this was, and that he was chosen somewhat at random. So, um, okay. Um, the really awful part about the astrologer killing Fell is that the shepherd takes his soul. So even in death, he's back in conquest's clutches and it doesn't look like he is going to get out anytime soon. Rose doesn't try to get him back, and Blake doesn't either, and um... So it looks like he's just kind of stuck there for a while. I hope they go get him at some point. Um, however much of him is left, that's just... depressing. By the end of this arc, it definitely looks like they have bigger fish to fry, but um... Sometimes you gotta fry the small fish. Blake is knocked out for three days. He dreams very vividly, and then he comes back. And it turns out that Rose has been making some decisions that he may or may not agree with. It seems like it's mostly things that he wouldn't have not done, um, but he really just doesn't like the fact that he wasn't there, which, you know, everybody can relate to. Um, but the interesting thing is that he was leader of this team for like 12 hours, and she was leader of this team for 72 hours um and it's just crazy to imagine that six arc sixes happened in the span that blake was asleep um that's kind of that's a lot to miss narratively we still got most of the information but um it it definitely feels like a lapse and then by the end of it, the only members of the Sad Sacks that are really left available are Maggie, Rose, Evan, and Blake. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're not really in a great spot. So they go, to, they, do, they go to Duncan's house and they threaten his fiancée and all that stuff. So it turns out that the Behames magic is only altering people's perceptions of time and not time itself. And they probably could do some time magic, but it would take way too much energy for them to really justify but I want to talk about the reveal that this is the case. I, I really liked this because it's been built up enough that most readers probably have a theory as to what the shtick is. Like, I was thinking it had something to do with both time and space, but I couldn't really figure it out. So, so the audience has been thinking about it, but it really only relies on the big examples that the audience can easily recall, even if they've been reading this in real time and it's been like months since they remember. Um, it's obvious enough that it's easy to understand, but it's also probably not something that anybody in the audience guessed, even though when you read it, you're like, 
of course that's what it is. And it, and it also makes perfect sense why they are able to use the tools that they use to fight it, like Evan, um, and closing your eyes, which not recommended, like, um, they use up June. Yeah. Um, the hyena dies. Okay. Um, strangely, I have this, like, adoration for Rose's little sub cabal. Um, whenever they do things, I just find it weirdly charming. Um, maybe it's because I, I don't see them as much of a threat. Like, I know that they can be scary, but I've never felt that they were particularly a threat to Rose or Blake or Evan. Um, so instead, I just, I, I just find them endearing and I find it kind of adorable when they're just kind of following Rose around. I know that sounds weird, but I do. Um, there's this moment when um, Corviday goes up to Duncan's room and when he comes out, he's wearing a jacket. And it seems like what happened is that he went up to Duncan's room and he found a jacket that he liked and he changed the owner to him and just kind of walked away with it. I just, I just found that endearing. Um, yeah, I'm glad Corviday lived, even though the other two seem to be out of the picture for now. Speaking of which, Corviday's whole shtick is this, like, owner switcheroo thing. Um, I want to know the karmic implications of this. Um, stealing is bad because it's, you're taking something away from the person that it belongs to, but Corviday changes the person that it belongs to, so does that mean that they can do this with no karmic issues? Um, probably not, but also, I'm not sure. So Conquest brings out these fragments of Blake's soul that contain memories of a particular scene from his life, and, um, and he looks at them and he feels shame. And, and he, he's thought about this a, a few times throughout the book, that he thinks about how people perceive him and do they think that he's some random homeless guy and do they think that he's a drug addict and he has this like, a, he has a little bit of a shame complex or an awareness of whether he should be feeling shame. Um, which makes it just, which just twists the knife a little bit that he can't see his reflection. There are some people who probably wouldn't care very much if they couldn't see their reflection. Um, but it seems like for Blake, this is something that he would really like to be able to see. Um, if only he had like a smartphone or something that could take pictures of himself and then look at it. I guess we'll never know. Um, also, interestingly, um, Blake says that he spent some nights on friends' couches after he left his family, um, and it doesn't appear to be Alexis or Goosh or whoever. Um, so it must have been, because he didn't know them, um, so it must have been that he spent nights on his friends' couches from wherever he grew up, um, which makes it even more disappointing that his family never found him because you know, as he said, it would have been excruciatingly easy to find him if he was literally staying at the houses of friends that he already had. That pretty much confirms that Blake's parents put in actually zero effort to find him, rather than just Blake perceiving it as not enough effort. They seem to have put in, like, none. Well, when Blake is in the memories, he's aware that he is in them, and even though he's experiencing them, we can see the thoughts that he was originally having separate from the thoughts that he's having now. Um, and when in the first flashback when he's being beat up by a bunch of teenagers, the original narration excuses the teenagers for beating him up because they're young. He isn't even angry at someone who is actually kicking him in the moment. Um, which just shows how much of a kind and gentle person he is 
maybe not even kind, but the absence of anger that he feels. Um, it's such an interesting trait. Interestingly, in this first flashback, he is cornered and he's able to fight back without thinking about whether or not he can. After his rape, he's always wondering whether he'll be able to run away or fight back. But before it happens, he seems much more able to not freeze in the face of danger. Um, and he assumes that he can defend himself. Um, I hate Laird and Duncan. I've, I've brought it up a few times. But something that they have both done is go on the offensive towards Blake by making him sexually uncomfortable. Um, and I may be the only person to think that they know, but I am pretty sure that they know. So we found out that Rhodes told Conquest about Blake having been raped, or that she thought that he was, before he went to the police station. So if Conquest told Duncan to hunt down Blake, um, Duncan would have access to that information. Additionally, Laird and Conquest both seem to know quite a bit about Blake that he, that Rose says she did not tell them. Now, there is an argument to be made that Laird was using magic to find out this information. But I think it's more likely that he got this information from the memories that Conquest has in his possession. Additionally, Conquest was acting when they first met, like he already knew what Blake's deal was. Um, so Laird knows he has baggage in this way and forces him to experience it again. Um, I, I would put it at I, I would say I am 90% certain that Laird knows that the second memory is a memory of rape. Um, so that brings me to a point. In one of Wildbow's other works, there are two people who share a body occasionally. And when one of them is in control, the other one cannot affect the outside world. Um, and at one point, one of the two people in the body attempts to initiate sexual contact with someone else without getting the consent of the other person in the body who would be experiencing this sexual contact at the same time. And the community discussed this for a while and came to the conclusion that subjecting someone to an unwanted sexual experience, even if there's some magic bullshit going on like someone else is in control, or it's a memory that already occurred. As long as that person is experiencing it, the person who inflicted the situation is doing something like rape. Um, Laird here, assuming that he knows what the second memory is, which I'm 95% sure that he does, willingly or willfully subjects Blake to sexual assault. That makes him the person responsible for the second sexual assault. And yes, Blake finds a way around reliving this memory, but it doesn't make me think very much of Laird. And spoiler alert, Laird dies immediately after this. Good fucking riddance. The sick thing about this whole scene where Blake is trying to get away is that Wildbow turns me into a sadist. The audience. Um, Blake is trying to get away, desperately. And in the back of your mind, when you're reading this, you're like, okay, I, I want Blake to be okay, but I really want to know what happened in this memory. And this is how we're going to get it. So the, th the sick thing that Wildbow did here is make me want Blake to experience pain. And I don't like it. <laughs> it. It makes something disgusting of me, the reader. Um, we get some confirmation that A, he was victimized by a man, 
um, which we could have guessed, but it's nice to have that confirmation in case we need it in the future. And that B, he already knew Alexis when it happened. Um, we don't know whether he already had the apartment. It seems like probably, if I had to guess, it seems like Alexis knew him and then this happened and then she decided that she was really going to help him out and help him get the apartment. That's my guess. So after this, Blake thinks of all of the reasons that he has to keep fighting. And he goes through each of his friends, his connections, in turn. He goes through Alexis and Evan and Rose and Maggie. And he comes to the conclusion that he doesn't want to live for any of them. He realizes that he wants to live because he doesn't want to die. And that sounds really simple, but what if Blake were to lose all of his connections? What if he were to, say, not remember any of these people that he just listed? I think that this lack of need to rely on others for, for his own motivation might just come in handy. Evan gives him tenacity, which is just awesome. It's a great scene. Um, Blake stabs Laird. I really wanted to cheer here, but because it came at the end of the chapter, I was like, something awful is going to come of this. Either Laird isn't going to be dead, or this is just going to get worse otherwise. And um, so even though I was really happy that Laird got stabbed in the neck and then bled out all over the place and then his blood was used to slow down Conquest while they were able to bind him, um, which was awesome. Um, he still has to deal with the Bahames, um, and it just kind of makes it not feel that triumphant. Um, I can never just feel good about somebody dying in a Wild Bow work. I kind of went out of order, but after after he relives the second memory, or part of it, he he has these this thought that he would like to charge into Conquest's bayonet, um, if only to make the pain in his head stop. And he says it in such a way that it's it's not what we've seen from him so far, but he slips into it so easily that you can tell that at some point in his life, this is what his life, this is what being in his head was like all the time. Then we get this internal monologue that says, he was approaching conquest and I was frozen in place, trying to get my mental bearings to convince myself to move, thinking of everything I had to fight for, but all I really wanted was peace. The two ideas conflicted. There it is. That's, that's Blake freezing in, in the face of someone bigger and more powerful than him. Um, that's, that's what happens in his head when he does it. Um, then Blake talks about how he doesn't want to deal with Conquest, who is more powerful than him, or the lawyers, who are also more powerful than him, but like individually not that bad. Um, but he was willing to deal with Pose because he's a known quantity. Um, which is just a reflection of the exact same dynamic that he has with Evan. Um, he chose Evan because he wants to deal with others who are not as powerful as he is, um, and he wants to help people and others. Um, Pose looks like a baby and acts like a toddler. Um, Conquest offers pretty much an Atwell family deal to the Thorburns. Um, yeah, really glad that didn't go anywhere because um, Blake doesn't know the full extent of how fucking awful that is. Um, I still don't think he or Rose would have taken it. Uh, Rose hasn't used magic at all during the contest, um, which is just another beat of me being both Blake and Rose legally. Um, not that that really matters much anymore. But I'm glad that they didn't screw that up after Pose pretty much explicitly told them that that was the case. So, good. Blake monologues in his head about how he doesn't feel like he's suited for this life at all. B Blake gives Ty a lot of shit for not knowing what 
who for not knowing how he wants to live his life um, and not committing to anything but Blake kind of is like that too um he knows a few things about himself but he doesn't know he doesn't know where he wants to go he doesn't know where who he wants to be um particularly um I don't think he's done an extraordinarily bad job as a practitioner other than the self-care bit he's even growing like at one point he almost swears something to Evan and realizes he can't keep the promise so he doesn't do it that's character development he says to Evan I don't think you should assume my life was typical in any way he's using his life in the past tense so Evan is ridiculously empathetic for a kid um and I can understand why some people might think that Evan might not be a realistic child, um, but I, I disagree. See, when I think back to how I was when I was eight, um, so that would have been at the end of second grade, during which time I only cared about Harry Potter, and then the beginning of third grade, during which time I only cared about Gregor the Overlander, and um, I aggressively resisted any thoughts or conversation topics that didn't revolve exclusively around those things. Um, so I would consider myself to be, I would consider my eight-year-old self to be less empathetic than the average third grader. Um, but what does a kid act like, right? They're there is no specific way that a kid acts because they're all different what do, what does a person act like and some are more emotionally intelligent than adults um at one point i was teaching and i had just received a promotion and um normally i did pretty well with teenagers but something about being in my new position kind of changed the way I acted and I acted a little bit too cocky and confident uh, especially since it didn't change the way I dealt with the children in any way um, so at one point I was I was teaching this class and um, there was a kid named M um, and he was scrolling through Instagram while I was talking and looking at the pictures of this one girl who was his age i presume she was someone that he knew and liked so i, I said in front of the class um uh, well em that girl is really pretty but her instagram will still be there when you get home um which is never the way that you should teach um you you praise in public and you criticize in private um but at the time, I just wanted him to listen to what I was saying. He, he's, he came up to me after class and he said, you embarrassed me. You told everyone that, you, you told everyone about the girl that I like. They asked me after class to show them the pictures that I was looking at. He said, you didn't have to embarrass me in front of everyone. Um, you just wanted to look like you were in control. And he was absolutely correct. The point being that there, most definitely are kids who are more emotionally intelligent than you um, or me um and evan doesn't have a whole lot of other skills um he is adorable for sure um and he can follow instructions but he's not usually the person that figures stuff out um usually so him being able to cheer people up is a perfectly good skill set for him so blake goes up to speak to the behames who have discovered that laird is dead and um one of laird's sons tells him that in his will he basically said that his remaining time would be divided among his children should something happened to him before his time um so in other words you can give time to other people 
which kind of explains how Granny Rose was able to have her life extended by Eamon. Um, the question is, where did Eamon get that extra time? Was he killing squirrels and giving her their individual years? I don't think so. So after this is all over and they capture Conquest and lock him in a toolbox, which, you know, good enough, um, it, it's not like he deserves a better location. The sad sacks go back to the factory to deal with the abstract demon. Um, and during this scouting mission, um, Blake keeps looking at Alexis and just like taking breaks in the narration to talk about how he thinks she looks and stuff. And it occurs to me that there is one less time manipulator in the world right now because Laird is dead. But that void could potentially be filled by Alexis because she seems to already be pretty good at changing Blake's perception of time. Um, and it's not that far of a leap to say that she could do it to others. There's this stupid little exchange where, um, where Blake says, Rose has access to the books. We can prop one mirror up by another to read them through the surface. And Rose says, provided I'm willing to keep going from person to person, turning pages on demand. And Blake just goes, yep, it's good these guys have a chance to wrap their heads around this. And I like having a chance to look at it from a distance without rushing. So he just completely steamrolls Rose's complaints. Not that this is anything different than what we've seen this entire book, but um, it's one of the last opportunities we're going to get to see this kind of bickering. So... Blake seems, like, weirdly allergic to the idea of Evan gaining additional powers. Rose seems to think it's viable, um, even if she kind of ping-pongs back and forth between agreeing with Blake and not. Um, but Rose has read the books, is my point, so she seems to think that it is possible for him to do so. Um, but Blake... Blake keeps saying, no, don't, don't change who you are, don't try to become more powerful. And it occurs to me that Blake has this lack of the concept that you can become better or that you can improve over time. Now, he knows that his life has gotten markedly better since he left his family, or especially since he left being homeless. But he doesn't seem to ever think that things can improve or that people can improve. Um, he did forgive Maggie, but it was more like he just blamed the problem on somebody else, um, which is great for team cohesion, but, um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting trait that has been fairly consistent for him throughout this. Um, Alexis says that she gets certain vibes from people, and this is something that I want to keep an eye on, assuming Alexis sticks around in the story, because Blake's Instincts have always been just extremely reliable, um, mostly. I want- and it seems like Alexis's vibes could potentially replace that or mirror that in some way. Um, she was right about the two examples that she gave. And two makes a pattern. Blake says that he wants to give people the benefit of the doubt until they give me reason to do otherwise. Um, now, it would have been very easy for Wildbo to use the word unless, but he uses the word until, which sort of primes us for there to be an actual betrayal by Maggie later. Um, am I expecting it now? No. But I was expecting it as soon as I read that sentence. So they visit the astrologer, and I just want to make a general comment that, it, that in all of Wildbo's works, he has a real skill for creating these spaces that feel lived in, um, that are unique. Um, Diana's garage being one such example, but there are countless others that just are, are spaces that feel like somebody's home in, in minimal time. While they're there, Blake says, I couldn't help but wonder what kind of implement a guy got when his defining trait was an inability to commit to a path. Um, Ty has other consistent traits other than just 
tries a bunch of stuff. Um, he talks about himself with a lot of cl clarity during his awakening. He talks about how he wants to be a better person and he wants to be the kind of person that he can look up to and respect. Um, he's not just the dude that's confused all the time. Um, he has other character traits that he can draw on when choosing things like this. I just want to bring this up since it's been bothering me since arc four. Um, Ty mentioned at some point that he tried to do a job with one of, with some of the sisters. Um, and, and Blake is like, no, the sisters are annoying to work with or something. I don't really remember, but then after that, pretty closely, the sisters were introduced, the magical sisters. Um, I am wondering if those are the same people. They don't seem like it. I feel like Blake would have brought that up at some point, but, um, um, I hope that I get an answer on that. Maybe not. We've brought up the idea that Blake is possessed so many times at this point that it has to be true on some level. Um, I don't know what he's possessed with. I'm kind of thinking that it might have been the radiation from the abstract demon um, because he bled himself out in the police station and then went and hung out with the abstract demon. Um, that's all I got. Um, I don't have any evidence to suggest that that is the case other than the timeline. The sisters are going to ask Alexis three questions in the future. Uh, seeing as Alexis will not remember Blake after this, this deal is either over or they're going to ask her a bunch of questions about Rose and she's going to be like, I don't know. They say that Rose is tainted by conquest. Um, now, it's entirely possible that she's received some conquest radiation, but... Even if Conquest has no radiation associated, um, she is still behaving differently than she would if she hadn't been around Conquest, right? Like, her reasoning in this whole arc largely stems from her not wanting to be Conquest's pet anymore, and hating Conquest, and acting on things that she said to Conquest, um, and that could be tainting enough. Um, yeah, I don't know. We haven't seen a textbook example of radiation and tainting, um, so I can't really compare other other than Blake and Poos, but it doesn't this doesn't seem like it's as extreme. Also, if if this is Rose just not wanting to go back to Conquest, it's exactly what Blake would do. Take steps to avoid being in a similar situation again, rather than improve how you would deal with a similar situation. Um, so Blake thinks about taking the hyena's sword as an implement. And I thought this was really stupid, but it's possible that I'm just missing something. So I made a pro-con list. Um, now there's, this has probably been analyzed to death. Um, I didn't go through all the comments um, or even any of the comments. So I just picked some comments that I didn't think anybody else probably already said. So pro, the hyena was pretty powerful beforehand. Now that one's pretty obvious. Con, a hyena is sort of like a dog, and Granny Rose says that he's not supposed to take a dog as a familiar, so I'm pretty sure that extends to implements. Um, pro, it's a sword, um, and we know from one of the other interludes that a sword is indicative of, you know, being a man, being manly. Um, which is what Blake wants. He wants to be more of a man. Um, Khan, it's a broken sword. So that's pretty much a commitment to always being a broken man. Yikes. It, it also feeds into that belief that he'll never get better. Uh, pro, the sword is a dead body, which is what Blake believes that he will be soon. 
um, Khan, he doesn't seem to think that this dead body will help him not be a dead body. Pro, if he takes it as an implement, Evan will have plenty of time to poop on it whenever he wants. Um, Khan, Evan couldn't really do that because Blake would still need to use it. Um, so that's my list. Um, changing the topic, the pacing of this arc was absolutely nailed for me. When I looked at the length of this arc um, before I started reading it, I just let out an involuntary sigh because I did not want to read 13 more chapters of back and forth between the Sad Sacks and Conquest's considerably stronger champions. Um, this is partially because this is not a tournament arc, right? So in sometimes you'll get like a tournament arc in in anime and manga and stuff and they're a lot of fun because they are they're low stakes you care about people on both sides the plot can progress in the background at the at the pace of whatever you want um, you get to learn about all the contestants um, and you get to see a bunch of cool fights um this is not like that you do get to see a bunch of cool fights and we are learning about conquest champions but we don't like them i'm not excited to see the eye lighting people on fire um not that i don't like this arc but i was starting to get a little bit tired of it um so the fact that they defeat conquest or at least temporarily defeat conquest halfway through and then move on to something else is a relief i forgot about page um so i'm gonna go back and talk about page um Wild Bo is a, a pretty lesbian-friendly author, and this is a pretty lesbian-friendly YouTube channel. But I'm gonna be unfriendly to a lesbian. I still think Paige is a fucking idiot. The fact that Paige placed her entire future on getting Hell's Glade House is even more frustrating when you find out that she's gay. She tried to keep it a secret, which arguably a good move if you really, really want the house. But when when Blake was given the note, he was he was given the letter that says, "You're gonna have to marry a man," and he's like, "I don't want to fucking do this," but he's doing it anyway. What we learn about Paige here is that she's not the type to suck it up and do the hard thing. I'm, I'm not saying that Paige should have to suck it up, marry a man, and start turning out children. But most people, I think, would turn away from the house when they realized that they do not fit what Granny wants. Um, because, presumably, because if, if Peter told Rose Sr. that Paige can't inherit the house because she has no intention of having children, that means that Granny Rose told them that whoever has the house is going to need to have children. So Paige went on this crusade to cut Rose's breaks and all that. Oh, that was Ellie. But Paige escalated the game between the girls. For, for what reason? And I know, it sucks to be told you can't do something because of, because of something that you are. But again... Paige has so many other paths she should have taken. Better paths. Inheriting something when one of your family members dies is not a good life goal. Additionally, she has found out that there is this weird cult thing. She, her cousin is dead. Her other cousin has murdered somebody. And everybody, Alexis, Blake... Everybody tells her, look, Isadora is going to eat you, and not in the sexual way. And she just completely ignores the latter half of that sentence. And yes, we find out later that Isadora is on their team and nice, but Paige doesn't put any particular effort into trying to find out whether Isadora is really the threat that everybody is making her out to be. She wants to receive things. 
and she's willing to do things to go get them, but she's not willing to step back and think, should I not do something so that I do not receive this thing? Um, in one case, it being Hill's Glade House, and in the other case, it being the affection of Isadora um, and the favoritism. Even when Isadora says, yep, I am going to turn her into my pet. What's that saying? Um, through rose-colored glasses, the red flags just look like flags? M maybe Paige will, will turn herself around on me. But right now, I I'm just very frustrated with her. Again, she, she looks for semantics, but she doesn't look for the truth. We find out that she, she found Isadora and then she just kind of stopped. I was gonna do this whole shtick on how they could have used a swarm of robots to investigate the, um, the abstract demon because I found out that the original robot plan didn't work and how much robot parts could they reasonably afford and could they use a kit that is intended for beginners and could they use Joel and Goosh to help them mass produce a bunch of kit bots that could investigate. But then Isadora says that this thing is, goes like several stories deep, more than several. Um, so what they really should have done is nuke it. Uh, we know from June and so on that after a certain amount of time, ghosts will just run out of energy. Um, they need to, it's, I assume this, the case is true for others, well, other others. Um, they should just pour gasoline into this hole in the ground and l continue to light it on fire until there is nothing left. So then Blake dies and the perspective shifts to Alexis. Now, I went really epileptic trees on coming up with a bunch of theories on why the perspective shifts to Alexis, but but it, it largely boils down to this. We have we can continue to be paranoid about Rose's intentions until we see inside her head. So Wild Bo probably just wanted to leave her until second to last, which he did. It also leaves the cliffhanger open for one chapter that she could be the next narrator. Um, now, he lost all of his connections, and as I said earlier, he has established this desire to continue living independent of his friends. Um, so I don't think he's actually dead. I think he's a sack of meat roaming around the factory. But if he is dead, I am glad that he died running, not freezing. And he probably is too, or would be. We get this great quote from Isadora that says, she knew he sought to do good and to vanquish evil, and she could surmise that both acts and the existence of ego evil had touched him deeply. Now this is all summed up in the second flashback, um, the evil being the rape and the good being Alexis, but um, it's, a, it's a great sum up of a large part of his character in a single sentence. It's kind of sad that the astrologer is the person who mourns Blake the most, um, but it's also kind of sweet that somebody is able to figure it out and give him the appropriate respect. Uh, I also want to say that earlier in the story I said that the Behames are defeated by him calling the police because they are used, too used to living in the magic world. Okay, that was just me being too used to tropes. They, there, there's, no, there's nothing that suggests that they're too separated from the rest of the world. We see the elder sister so separate from even the conversation she's having. And it just, and, and and also she doesn't particularly appear to care about Blake. Um, and it, it just brings up that quote, um, the opposite of love isn't hate, it's apathy. Um, so on that note, let's talk about Rose. Um, so the very first memory that Rose has, as soon as she wakes up outside of the mirror, is, is that she was sent to the summer camp by her parents in order to try to make her more social, which would help her get the inheritance. And it just goes to show that other than the 72 hours where she was captain of the sad sacks, she has been a pawn in somebody else's plan for her entire life. Um, college is not a place where you get to be particularly free. That might sound wrong, but your life is re revolves around a schedule. Your life is structured. You live in a specific place. 
when you go to specific classes and associate with specific people. Um, Rose went to college partially to escape the pressure to be the Thorburn heir. The, the, uh, the biggest difference between Blake and Rose is that she had this structured life and he did not. Rose wrote this note when she was angry, so she gets angry with herself that she didn't explain things in the note, um, but she understands that she would do that if she was angry. Um, Blake is a little tiny bit more sentimental than this, but that's it. Just a little bit. I, I skimmed some of the top comments on this chapter, so I think that most people are going to disagree with this take, but this Rose does not remember being in the mirror, does not remember Conquest, does not remember who Tiffany is, she doesn't remember Evan, she doesn't remember Blake. She, the only thing she remembers is the stuff that she has learned from the books, and I'm, I'm guessing she used Alexis's name right as she came out of the mirror, so she remembers that. Um, she doesn't... We, what we have here is Rose 3. This is a whole new Rose. The last one we can tell, especially from the note, that she was becoming angrier and angrier and angrier. But that Rose is dead. Um, all of the memories of what has happened in the story thus far are pretty much gone. She remembers some facts, but this is effectively the Rose that we saw in chapter one. Um, and the, the note ends with, you know what you have to do. And she says that she needs to go to Jacobsville. This is fascinating because it means that Rose was given this directive before she met Blake, presumably by Granny Rose. Again, she has always been a pawn in somebody else's plan. Um, we also find out that she, she, she was apathetic towards Blake, but she didn't try to cause him to die, um, which is nice, I guess. Uh, additionally, she tells the sad sacks that they can come with her or not. She's not manipulative by nature, um, which is reassuring. Um, I, and I know that sounds really, really optimistic, but, but these are all qualities that we've seen in Blake. We've just seen them to, I don't know, 70% of what we're seeing out of Rose and, and only internally. Um, also, she doesn't tell herself about Blake, which I'm pretty sure she couldn't if, if she just wrote a note that says, hey, in case Blake disappears, this is who Blake is, because then the note would disappear. Additionally, supporting my Rose, this Rose is a new Rose imagery, um, Rose just got a massive haircut. Um, and if you have short hair, it can be easy to underestimate the importance or significance to someone losing their hair. Um, I happen to know that my hair, because I bleached it at one point, I can and I can see where the bleach still is, I happen to know that my hair is six years old. So this, this growth is six years worth of growth. Um, so when a person loses their hair in media, it's, it's symbolic of becoming a new person, um, or trying to be a new person, so that when you look in the mirror, you see yourself differently. You see the shape of your face differently. Um, now, Rose 2 couldn't see herself in the mirror, but Rose 3 can, assuming that what's left of Blake isn't in the mirror. If, if we assume that hair, that a haircut represents a change, this haircut represents change in Rose. So, for one, Rose has never been able to see connections before. Um, and she has said this after she lost the ability to lie, so, um, I... this is interesting. She can see connections now. I wonder if it's because Blake gave her so much Blake that she has an ease of using the connections that she otherwise wouldn't have. We know she sees other things. Um, can she no longer see whatever she could see before? I don't know. She appears to take on Evan as a familiar. Um which looks like it would work, 
I guess. So Evan will accept this offer because she helped him when he was dying and he will probably be grateful for it. Um, he would also accept the offer because otherwise he was about to die, but that's beside the point. Um, he can and I think will help her to be stronger, kinder, and more altruistic. Um, Blake says that he hopes that Evan doesn't become a schemer like Rose, but I don't think that Evan has it in him to be a schemer. Um, or not very much of one anyway. What he can really do is be, be himself around Rose. Rose too, the one that is effectively dead, was becoming angrier and angrier and spiraling out um, and becoming worse. I think with Evan at her side, she will go the same direction that Blake went. Much like how Blake used Evan to commit to the lifestyle detailed in Black Lamb's Blood. Additionally, su supporting my Rose 2 is deadish point, um, if you read the note, she always refers to... Rose 2 refers to herself as I, and refers to both her and the future Rose, metaphorically Rose 3, as we. Um, she knows that if Blake gets eaten, a new her would exist. Um, new, metaphorically. Anyway, with Evan and Rose, um, I don't think that it will be anywhere as pure and good as it was between Blake and Evan. But that doesn't mean that it can't be something good at all. So The abstract demon notes that the graffiti is binding. Um, I wonder if the if the graffiti is binding because it is artistic, because it is human creation, uh, which opposes darkness. Just a theory. I want to know what's going to happen to Conquest. Um, the only person who has access to Conquest right now is Joel. Um, and Joel is a blackguard. Everything in that toolbox is protected by rune after rune after rune. Joel can't get in there. Um, unless he conscripts the help of, say, Alexis. Um, that would really suck if, um, if Alexis ended up letting Conquest back out. But I think she's not stupid enough to do that. So reactions to Blake's death in the comments that I skimmed were mixed. Um, most of them were about how much people hated Rose and really hoped that she was not the narrator for the rest of this book. Um, and it's just, it's interesting what Wildbow has built through his reputation. So I, um, I wrote this fan fiction a while back that was reasonably popular. It was popular enough that I could go into certain discords disguised as somebody else and snoop on what people were reacting to the story as it unfolded. And I planned for the whole story um, to, at about the one-third mark, have one of the two narrators get, like, brutally impaled. I wanted the audience to genuinely feel fear for her life, and I wanted her to have to spend a lot of time recovering from this, and that most of the plot would be taken over by by the events that followed that event. Um, so I, I spent the first several chapters building up to this, and at, at the point that I had always intended, I, I wrote this extremely brutal scene where she was maimed, and, and it looked, and it was intended to look like she was very much dead. Um, and everybody reading I, I, I just got a whole bunch of messages from from readers that says, that was great, can't wait for the next one. Um, because they did not believe at all that I would do anything to the protagonist. Um, because I was a fan fiction writer, of course I wouldn't. Particularly because they could see that I intended the story to be three times as long as it already was. But they weren't affected in the slightest. Whereas in the comments of Pact, in, in chapter 7.11, 
um, people were already angry over the prospect of Rose being the next narrator, even though there was technically nothing that particularly indicated that she would be. Um, it didn't even say that Blake died. So while Beau has a reputation that causes people to assume that he will take the most painful option, which is an interesting reputation to have. So yeah, that's what I've got. Um, next week is Arc 8 Signature. Um, I would like to be able to speculate that it has something to do with the legal definition we've kind of been searched we've kind of been circling around of Rose and Blake being the same person legally um but unfortunately I already know that the next one's an interlude arc so oh well um next week arc eight signature see you the next one